Hello, I am Panos Kodzathanasis, and this is ASEAN Movie Pulse Interviews. Today I'm here with JX, producer and filmmaker from Singapore. How are you, JX? Uh, hi, I'm good. Apart from the weather being very hot, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we can't do much about that, I guess. <laughs> okay, so let's take things from the beginning. How did you start being in the cinema industry, the movie industry? Um, how did I start being in the film industry? Um, so I, I started off watching a lot of films, um, especially when I was in law school. So I was in law school for four years and um, I used to skip school and classes so I can watch films. Um, and I think when you start watching films, you, you start to like a few directors and you start to explore more. And from there, I really wanted to make films. So I started to make uh, short videos with my friends using the school equipment. Um, and then there was uh, a short film competition, which I participated in, in which um, Eric Ku was a judge. And I was very fortunate because I think he, he, he and the judges liked um, my short film. So um, that gave me the chance to, to um, break into the industry as an intern. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay. And how is your cooperation with Eric Ku and Zhao Wei Films in general? Well, I, I guess I've, I've been there for, for, for ages. Um, next year will be my 10th. We'll, I will have worked at Zawe for 10 years um, come next uh, April. Um, and it's, it's great because it's an environment, I think, where we try to celebrate um, authorship, um, having an independent voice, and also trying to do what's, I think, relevant to um, the market as well, you know, starting off doing more feature films, supporting younger directors, and then now, of course, moving into doing more uh, series work as well um, for HBO Asia. Um, and I think some of the exciting things that we are doing, for example, is we're also doing not just series, but also pushing, trying to do more feature films. So two of the feature films that I've been um, developing and working on, uh, one would be uh, In My Mother's Skin, which is a three country co-production with uh, Bianca and Bradley from Epic Media, that's in the Philippines, and with Stefano uh, from Taiwan. So I think that's quite an exciting collaboration for a Filipino World War II horror film. Um, and the other thing, I guess, uh, which could be interesting as well, is um, that I've been working with uh, the Zhuang brothers, it's a, their twin brothers who are animators, to do, I think, the first uh, Singaporean animation film since Araku's Tatsumi in 2011. Um, so I think that's something that we've been developing for quite a while and it's picking up steam. So mm -hmm. excited to try new things and to learn new things as well since our industry keeps evolving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so you have been with Eric Ku since your 20s, right? Since 20s? Yes, he's, he's, he's robbed me of my youth. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. And uh, usually as a producer, what, what are your duties, let's say, in Eric Ku's films? What are your duties there? So, uh, my duties, uh, I guess it, it differentiates from um, director to director, but generally it would be, a lot of it would be um, raising financing for the film and then moving on to um, the physical production, making sure that we can do it in time and in budget and of course coordinating post-production. Um, so those would be the main scope of work that I currently do, although I know of course a big part of um, Producing also involves like handling the sales and managing the distribution part of it. But I think that's an area which I'm still learning uh, from more seasoned producers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how difficult is financing movies nowadays? I think it depends on the type of movie you're financing and um, the scale of, of your production as well. So let's say you're trying to raise like, Two three million dollars in Southeast Asia, uh, which generally has a more lifted market. Uh, that's very difficult, especially for an art house film. Uh, but let's say you're doing a commercial film, you have big stars and a big director attached to it, a seasoned director with a box office record, then it's more reasonable. So I think it, uh, there are a few factors comes into play. I think definitely the director's uh, reputation is one, the stars that are attached to it, the nature of the project, that means the ability to hit uh, different markets is also important when it's able to travel internationally as meant for more a domestic market the size of the domestic market as well uh, obviously singapore has a very small domestic market 
um, because we have a, we're a very small country of 5.6 million. So even though we have a very high cinema going rate also, our appetites are actually more geared towards international films. So a lot of people watch um, Hollywood films here as well, uh, more Chinese language films. Um, and I think last year there was only one local film in the top 10 um, in, in the box office. Um, of course, then when you raise more micro-budget features, then I think that's where it becomes a lot more sustainable mm -hmm. um, because there are grants uh, from across Asia, which you can tap onto, and a lot of Asian producers are also savvy enough to work with European co-producers often because they have good grant uh, opportunities there as well. And, and that helps to make us... Um, easier for us to finance films and to reduce the risk for um, our investors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in general, would you say that you are in favor of co-productions with European countries in particular? I'm in favor of co-productions with any country, to be honest, as long as it is. I always believe it's not just about the money, but it's about the value add to the film as well. In terms of, um, and, and some of the best experiences I've had is really working with Uh, crew from um, different countries, learning how they do things, seeing how they do things. And it's this exchange of ideas that allow us to um, improve our craft as filmmakers, I think, uh, in terms of the possibility of what we can do as well. Um, so I wouldn't limit it to just Europe. I think increasingly there's more avenue to just co-produce within Asia and to finance it. So In My Mother's Skin be a good example where we used just um, Taiwan Uh, funds and also uh, Filipino uh, government grants to finance the film. Um, and, you know, may maybe if there are more grants coming up from Southeast Asia, then we'll see a more diverse, uh, ambitious uh, landscape for cinema in the region. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And you mentioned there was uh, one local movie in the box office last year. Which one was it? Uh, there's only one that can be, right? Uh, by this, our, our only uh, successful consistently successful commercial filmmaker, which is Jack Neal. Mm -hmm. So he has a style of filmmaking and I think a lot of his films are a bigger budget, but how he's able to finance it is through very um, blatant product placement. So that's uh, an unfortunate reality where the, where the person holds up and tells you that this is the best product in mm -hmm. the world, in the middle of the film, which I think it's, um, I guess, a style. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I get it. Uh, so, uh, how would you describe uh, Singaporean movie industry in general at the moment? I think we're, we're, we have we have great um, landscape, to be honest. Um, I think we have a, we have done very well for small country, um, especially in the um, festival circuit for and for more indie independent cinema. So you have a new wave of Singaporean filmmakers like Wu Jun Feng. Anthony Chen, who is obviously doing very well. Mm -hmm. uh, Kirsten Tan, whose first film, Pop Eye, uh, won a few awards at Sundance. And I believe she's currently working on the second film, um, amongst other filmmakers who are emerging. Um, and I'm actually even more excited about the younger generation after them, who I feel is asserting their own ideas of what cinema, a Singaporean cinema can be, uh, separate from um, a more Eurocentric audience. I think that is quite interesting. So they are trying to find ways to represent, uh, for example, language in cinema. I think that's, because uh, you know, most of Singaporean cinema often it is would be spoken in Chinese because that's the way uh, how most of the West still feels views Singapore. That um, if Singaporeans speak English, it is very uh, abnormal, uh, very weird, uh, very strange, right? Mm -hmm. But actually English is the dominant language in Singapore. Um, it's just what we're used to, and I think this is um, a, 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 bias, a certain bias, but you're seeing younger filmmakers trying to insert um, in the English language in their short films with Singlish, which is a mixture of Singapore and English, mm -hmm. is what you call it, uh, being more exerted more aggressively in its, its current form, and I think recapturing that identity is, is very exciting, and so I think we have a very vibrant, independent uh, scene, and a lot of very successful, independent um, Filmmakers like Fran Borgia, who produced uh, Golden Leopard, uh, and also Uni, uh, which won a prize in Toronto. We also have Wei Jie, who did uh, Taste by Le Bao, which I think did very well, uh, won a award in Berlin, I believe. Mm -hmm. And he also was a co producer on Vengeance is Mine or Other Space Cash, which is the Golden Leopard winner, uh, done by Edwin. 
along with Su uh, you know, so I think the landscape here it's pretty exciting for independent filmmaking. But when it comes to genre filmmaking and when it comes to commercial filmmaking, I think that's an area that's been feels a little bit neglected. Uh, and it's an era which I'm uh, a little bit more interested in um, developing here. You have a rough estimate of how many local movies are being produced every year? It varies, but at the peak, I think two, three years ago, we had about like uh, 10, 10 to 12 on average. I mm. think last year, maybe it dropped to maybe four or five, mm -hmm. um, max six. But we're talking about like really small independent films, which may not even have a theatrical release, you know, in some cases. And uh, does the government help at all with movies? The government is extremely supportive when it comes to uh, filmmakers. So we have a grant to support first-time filmmakers in Singapore. Um, it is a grant, I think, that goes up to 300 SGD. So that's about um, 220 euros. Um, and that is really goes to first and second-time filmmakers to make their feature films. Um, and then you would have bigger one grand quantums for more experienced filmmakers to, to support them as well. On top of that, there are, there's actually a short film grant as well for filmmakers to practice their craft. Um, and of course, when films, uh, feature films or short films do well in uh, festivals, the government does pay for flights to travel to other countries, which is great because I think so much of growing as a filmmaker is that conversation that... Um, that exchange that, that you only get when you go to a festival. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And uh, how about censorship? How are the laws in that regard in Singapore? Yeah, so censorship is a more sensitive issue here, I think because we are in a very a multiracial, multi-religious country where we really protect those freedoms. So um, when it, it's very difficult to have a conversation about uh, religion and race in films. Um, and I think, of course, um, there is a lot of emphasis on um, accurate factual representation. So when it comes to anything that um, may suggest uh, things which are factually inaccurate of the government, I think that's where it becomes a bit more sensitive as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, what about, let's say, violence or nudity? Or is there censorship there? I think... Um, I, there's definitely censorship when it comes to violence and nudity. I think nudity is actually treated with more uh, sensitivity than violence. Violence feels pretty, pretty okay, to be honest. <laughs> um, so I think, I think, let's say, if you show, if, if you have a female upper body nudity, maybe you would be pushed up to an NC-16 immediately. Whereas maybe, um, I don't know, maybe a decapitated leg would still be PG-13. I feel like violence is, there's a lot more tolerance for violence than a nudity here in, in Singapore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And uh, one of the first movies you worked for was The Apprentice. Can you tell me a bit about that? Oh, yes. Um, incredible experience. I think that was uh, very DIY also because um, I know it has a very expensive look to the film, but I think it was really all hands on deck. So every day on set, I would change to a police officer outfit because I would be an extra when they are short of extras. <laughs> um, our other, our other uh, producer was actually bald as well. So actually he became a monk on certain days when he needed a monk. <laughs> uh, so it's really, really uh, independent filmmaking. Uh, we got a really good team. And I think um, what helped a lot was just extremely good planning and, and uh, fostering a good communication on set. But uh, I think it was definitely, we, we accomplished a lot with a very tight budget as well. And I think what another interesting part of it is just how Raymond, uh, the delegate producer, alongside Fran, was able to wrangle all these different uh, financing from so many different places that allows a film of this scale and quality to be made as well. Um, but I think the, at the heart of it all, of course, it is uh, Jun Feng, the filmmaker himself, who is able to... Um, just really dive into an issue and, and try to make it and open it up into a conversation here, which I really en enjoy. Um, but actually working on the film, I think it was always very stressful 
budget was always a huge problem. <laughs> and um, I think, but you know, in, in the thick of all this stress, you just have to find a way to solve the problems and to move on as a team, you know. Um, and I think um, having that collaborative uh, relationship with the director is great. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, what about a uh, ramen shop, which is complicated production in Singapore, Japan, and France? So how was that experience? Right. Uh, actually, I felt like uh, ramen shop was easier, <laughs> easier to work on. On a whole, I think um, the scale was slightly smaller than Apprentice. There was no set build and everything as well. Uh, and the best part is that I think whenever you work on an Eric Koo production, you can eat great food, which is <laughs> great for our booster. If you go to Japan, you eat good food. Singapore, you eat good food. Um, it was really nice. I think when we first worked with the Japanese, I think there were some slight cultural differences, as you would with any country. All, all the projects I worked on in every country I worked in, it's really the communication style that's very different uh, because Singaporeans are very blunt and very direct, right? In contrast to maybe the Japanese where, you know, when I, I feel sometimes there's a little bit of discomfort, but they may not say it outright. So it's about finding the most effective and efficient way to communicate given all the constraints that we're working around as well. And I think going through a process like that with a feature film, it really builds um, very long-term bonds and, and friendships and, you know, I still work with the Japanese team till today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, the film was quite successful. It screened all over the world, found distribution in many countries. Uh, why do you think that success came? I think because, um, you know, it, it, the world is a little bit depressing at this point in time. <laughs> um, so I think oh, it's, it's nice to, I think a lot of people gravitate towards content that is just a little bit more escapist. Um, and what's more escapist than a good bowl of comfort food, right? A soup mm -hmm. in this case. And the film really speaks about healing and um, it also has a very dominant uh, food culture that's been exported to the rest of the world, basically Japan. And I think Singapore is viewed with a lot of interest as well. So uh, I, I think that made it a very uh, easy watch. Um, I think the other thing that filmmakers... When we're thinking purely commercially, um, it's really about um, your target audience, right? And, you know, in a film like this with no nudity, no violence, um, then you get a low rating, you have a higher chance of audience, and that's a risk that distributors are able to take. Because um, even if you like something personally, whether you have an audience to make it sustainable for you to recoup what your minimum guarantee is, it's a whole different ballgame. And I think when um, filmmakers are... Uh, I mean, for distributors as well, it's not easy for them in this current climate, especially with the rise of OTT platforms, kind of like cannibalizing their market share. Mm -hmm. Although I do believe there is still definitely a space for cinema, a very big space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, how about uh, Buffalo Boys? It's an Indonesian film, so other kind of experience? Yeah, I think with Indonesia... Uh, in contrast to Japan, Japan, you know, everybody is very timely. And uh, I mean, doesn't, I don't speak for all Indonesian production, of course, but I feel like uh, just like Buffalo Boys is a spaghetti Western in, in uh, Indonesia. Um, working in Indonesia, is a, to me, is a little bit like working in a cowboy town. Mm -hmm. You kind of got to go with the flow and the mood of everything as well. Um, you know, so for example, whenever we had meals, you'd have, um, you know, sometimes you, it, depending on where you're shooting at, you have the local, the, the local, um, I don't know, what's the right word to use, the local enforcers come down to eat with you. Oh, really? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, what was really surprising to me, I was non-believer before, um, is that they have this thing called a BOMO. And a BOMO is, a, is like a witch doctor as well. So basically, what they're brought to set is to bless the set to clear the weather. So I remember watching once thinking it was going to rain. So but they just called the bomo and the bomo started chanting and I was I was shocked. You know, I saw I saw the clouds literally part around the set and um, we could still shoot as though it was day daytime. It's uh, one of those things where it's very hard to believe until you see it. And I think Indonesia is one of those places where uh, it can feel a little bit uh, challenging. 
uh, given how things are, are done in, in, and communicated in advance, um, there's a different style of producing. But I think they can do so much in Indonesia. They have done so much. The quality of cinema and passion of the crew is unparalleled. Like um, some of the some of my favorite tech crew I work with are from Indonesia. And I always bring them to Singapore to work as well. And uh, the just the generosity of spirit is something that I have really learned from Buffalo Boys. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, after this experience, did you start believing in the supernatural? Definitely. I, I, I saw way too much creepy <laughs> things in uh, Indonesia to not believe in it. Um, you know, we had actors who were afraid they were being haunted uh, the night before. And when you go to their room, there's a general spooky aura. You know, I remember I was even drinking in the rooms of one of the Thai crew. We had Thai stuntmen come down and I was drinking the crew uh, at night and Downstairs, we heard furniture being thrown around. And I said to the crew, what's, what's going down downstairs? And um, Thai crew just said, oh, this happens every night. It's just a, it's just a ghost that comes at around 12 to 1 p.m. every night. <laughs> okay. So it seems like a very interesting experience. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I would never forget my time on Buffalo Boys. I think it's, it's made me appreciate uh, Batik, Gojek, and uh, patience, I guess, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, what about uh, folklore and food that you work next? Uh, so I think the book were slightly different experiences. I think folklore was the first time when I was um, working with um, so many, we were first time working with HBO on an anthology style project. And I think that, of course, working with the network is a very different experience as well when you work with the network because there are, you have another party that comes in as collaborators and to communicate with, with their goals and the filmmakers' goals, uh, though those would be maybe uh, more sensitive areas to, to look out for. Um, but again, you know, getting travel to, to on Formula One, I worked on um, Korea, Malaysia, and a little bit of Indonesia, and it was, it was great. I had a great time. People were awesome. And, you know, I think it's, I think um, Southeast Asia, we can, we can do even more horror films. I think that's something that, that, the crop is, is, you can see it improving as well with time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and in general, how was your cooperation with HBO? Are you satisfied or? Uh, yeah, of course, of course I'm very satisfied. I think that um, they definitely give a lot more uh, leeway for collaboration and communication. And um, it feels like a two-way conversation, which I really appreciate as well. And, um, you know, I think we that way when, uh, you know, in, in, in a way, we are service providers, right? Because they, they have commissioned us to do it. But when your service provider feels empowered and it's able to actively work with you and you are listening, then I think that's when you get a better product because, um, and of course, the service provider needs to listen to the needs of the network as well because you need to know what the market wants. Uh, because I think all this is about finding a way to build a long-term relationship where your content increasingly can reach a, a bigger audience as well. Because what we are doing essentially uh, with the platform of HBO Asia is like exporting Asian culture to the rest of the world. So I think it's like uh, folklore is like a little taste into the supernatural beliefs of um, Southeast Asia, you know, or rather Asia, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, what about your film, Piece of Meat? How did that come about? Right. Uh, so Piece of Meat was, was obviously a lot of fun. I think that was this was an, Eric, an idea that Eric had many years ago. Um, and of course, then when he asked Gerald um, to, whether Gerald wanted to work on it and, um, you know, bring me on board as well, I think then we came up with a few other ideas just to structure the film just a little bit differently. I think Gerald's uh, technique for stop motion with his team was phenomenal. And I think we just had a lot of fun doing it as well um, because I've always enjoyed uh, satire having been heavily influenced as a child from, by Monty Python. So like getting getting to, to, to do it in a, in a country like uh, Singapore just feels like appropriate, you know, where everybody takes themselves so seriously, maybe, you know, could do it a bit <laughs> of a yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the film got you to come, right? How was that? Yes, um, so that obviously is, it's, as a filmmaker, it's a great honor to, to go to Cannes in whatever capacity. Uh, must say though, uh, first time I went to Cannes with Apprentice was very different from the second time when I went to Piece of Meat. When I went to Piece of Meat as a, as a director, it was, it was really awesome because I could have a lot more time to watch more films. 
mm -hmm. uh, and to to meet and talk to different people as well. Um, so I I just wish Jairo, my co-director, could have spent more time with me in um, Khan. Yeah. But, um, yeah, well, I think we, we both have had a memorable experience and uh, yeah, hope, hopefully you can go back one day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay, and, uh, okay uh, how, it, how much does it cost to make a film like Piece of Meat? Because uh, animation is usually very expensive in comparison to live action films. Yeah, so I think um, Piece of Meat was really a product of, of a lot of labor uh, and a lot of passion. And so when, when, how should I put this? The, the cost of it would be close to maybe about like 10K USD, which is much less in other countries. But I think that is only because all the filmmakers that worked on it really did it believing in, in the outcome of it and not doing, uh, not charging market rates or anything for it when we were actually actively producing it as well. And of course, a lot of things, we, would, we did it in a slightly more uh, indie way as well when it came to certain sound design elements, or certain like um, the music, uh, the lyrics for the music, for example. Um, you know, like things like that would be something that I would write. Um, sound designers, like something, you just gather the sounds and plus the sound design and work them together. So it's really, I think the spirit of making a short film is very different from uh, doing a, a feature. And of course, doing the first feature is very different from doing a second and third feature as well, because that's when you expected to do things with a little bit more, um, uh, how should I put it, more more union friendly, so to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so, do you plan to continue on animation or in terms of directing? I mean, right. Uh, in terms of directing, I like to do more live action, but maybe a live action animation mix. Um, I, I really appreciate the medium uh, a lot, especially since I feel like everybody in Asia grows up on a diet of Japanese anime. Um, but before I even get to, to, to put, even thinking about directing animation again, I really want to produce uh, animation. And I think that's why I've been speaking to the domestic um, scene here, which I think has a great, um, great generation of animators with, of course, Gerald, the Zhuang brothers. We have Wei Kiong, who's works frequently are uh, seen in uh, Berlin as well. And Colleen Cole, who's mm -hmm. a filmmaker whose work is in NSC and I think just uh, as we as we just traveling and I think to do a feature film and to to show that what animators can do it's course is a big passion of mine. So uh, right now we've been developing a story for two years and just trying to finance it and, and get it going as well. So hopefully that will come out in like what 2024. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, do you think you will continue in both capacities, both as producer and filmmaker, or are you? I, I, I know this is quite more uncommon, um, but yeah, I, I do hope to be able to continue doing both. Um, I don't see myself as someone who wants to direct all the time as well. I rather have the freedom to direct when I have an idea, I flesh out an idea. Mm -hmm. And then of course, when it comes to producing, I, I just, just really enjoy working with people who I really respect and to find a way to see see what what they had in, in mind at the beginning and see how they trans, transform into something real as well. That 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 just brings me a lot of, of joy and pride. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in general, do you watch a lot of movies? Always a question I have. <laughs> right. I don't know what a lot is. If you ask me. Whether I watch as much as, as many movies as you do, uh, I don't think <laughs> I, I won't be able to compete. Uh, but I think um, in terms of the range of films that I watch, I would say I'm pretty decent in terms of the types of films I watch. I watch everything from the more art, art house fair um, to the more um, commercial fair as well. So, for example, recently I watched um, the Telugu film RRR. Mm -hmm. which is great. I, that's amazing. I think it's so over the top. It's great. It's like one of a kind, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But I think also watching a lot of, uh, it's, it's been really nice watching a lot of the art house films and, and in Southeast Asia and to see these filmmakers emerge, especially from uh, countries like Indonesia uh, and Vietnam. And, you know, I think, you know, having gone to the festivals for a while, you know, I also spend a lot of time watching a lot of my friends' uh, films, who, which, who, which may be released in the next few years. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but do you think it's, a, it's important for a filmmaker to watch a lot of movies because the opinions differ on the subject? 
Wow, that's interesting. I would say, of course, you must watch a lot of films. I believe that you must watch a lot of films. I do agree. But I feel like um, on that note, also I'll say that you can't just watch films to be a filmmaker. I, you kind of need to uh, live life and to explore different kinds of disciplines, different kinds of art forms, I think, you know, because um, that allows you a, a more unique perspective or, or maybe a more well-rounded perspective um, of the world. And, and maybe this is a bit controversial to say, but recently during COVID uh, in Singapore, they did a poll, right? They did a poll on um, which jobs are seen as non-essential. And I think a lot of Singaporeans said, oh, being an artist is not essential. Mm-hmm. It caused a huge furor in um, the arts community because many many people said it's very important. And, and while I agree it's important, I think also understanding the relevance of it, like I know how powerful cinema can be, but um, it's also very different from say um, nurses, uh, like doctors and things like that. And I think understanding that importance and, and showing it that respect as well puts into perspective my role as a filmmaker, my role as a storyteller as well, that it's not, my, it's not just my authoritarianistic vision that I'm imposing on my subject, but it's about having that relationship and that ability to listen to what the subject's actually trying to do and, and what they're trying to do uh, and why they're trying to do it and, and the struggle um, that allows me to form maybe more um, diverse connections than I would have initially had Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. And uh, about in my mother's skin, can you share maybe some more details what's going to be about and what's happening there? It's a huge production sure. as far as I can see. Yeah, Yeah. actually, I think it's quite a aggressively budgeted film, uh, given the scale of what we're trying to do. Um, but we have a great cast. I, I was on set uh, just last week. We shot an island in uh, Baklut. And um, basically, the film is a world, it's, a, it's set in World War II. And it's about a young girl um, who is left by her to take care of the family by her father because the father used to be a very wealthy plantation owner. But since then, you know, obviously because of World War II, they are running out of food. They are trying desperately to survive. So the father goes out to take care of business to secure the family's future. And the young girl is left to take care of the mother. Now, the mother falls really sick when... Um, the father leaves and, and the, being the eldest daughter, she does not know what to do. She doesn't have enough food to give the mother and everything. So while foraging for food in the forest, she meets a fairy who gives her something to feed her mother. And when she feeds her mother, her mother starts to transform and be, to become a flesh-eating uh, vampire, uh, Filipino <laughs> vampire. So now the daughter needs to take care of the family, which includes her flesh-eating Filipino Empire of a mother, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, have you finished filming, or is it still going on? No, it's still going. It's still ongoing. Uh, it should be done um, end of uh, early July. So actually, we have about like seven days left of shoot. Uh, but if we're just watching the stills, I think um, the team is great. It's also really nice that we have a mixture of Singaporeans. Uh, Filipinos working together on set, and then of course we do some of the post production in uh, Taiwan as well. Mm-hmm. But it, it is being shot in the Philippines, right? That's right. Oh, okay, and h- how is it working in the Philippines? Because I think it's the, the craziest of the countries, as far as I can say. Oh wow! Uh, actually, <laughs> well, I find a lot of similarities in uh, Philippines and in. Um, Indonesia in some sense, but I would say that honestly, working with uh, Bianca from Epic Media and, uh, you know, Bradley and the team that they've assembled, uh, fantastic. I think they're extremely passionate. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody was really on the ball and I think um, I really respected that they had a rule to keep to 14-hour shoot days, which is very uncommon in Asia. Usually, people work up to 20, 22 hours, um, which has led to a lot of long-term health issues. Um, and you know, one, one thing that's amazing is that, um, I've never seen this practice elsewhere as much, but they got, they, all the actors have acting coaches in the Philippines. So, you know, um, we had two, we have two, two young children, children, right. Uh, playing the leads, which is, uh, the, the, the daughter Tala and the, and the brother Bayani and the acting coach would just call out their names and do this action and tell them to keep it smaller. And then they would just respond and react uh, like the acting coach would just go like, 
control your feelings, uh, feel your feelings, and then they, they will start crying on set. And I thought, wow, this this is great acting coach. And, you know, we, we'd love to see more <laughs> acting coaches in, in uh, across Asia as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I guess the last question, uh, now that you mentioned actors, how do you feel is the level of acting in Singapore, local actors, I mean? Well, you, you put me in a very difficult spot to answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay. No, no, but I, will answer, I, always, answer, I always answer honestly either way. Um, but I think that um, I, I, I think that the actors in Singapore are very passionate. I think you give up a lot in Singapore to become an actor because the cost of living in Singapore is very high. And to, to become a successful actor is, is very difficult because it's not just about, there are very few good roles and good, and, and good writing. So it is, I think it's a problem of the broader industry rather than the actors themselves. Um, but I think that um, actors gaining more exposure and, and treating it more like a craft would definitely raise the, the quality of performances in, Singapore, and I, I, I know that we're not too far away from that. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that's it. Thank you very much, Dex, for being in Asian Movie Pulse interviews. And uh, this is Panos Kodzathanasis, and hope to see you soon. Bye. All right. Thank you.